But now let's think about this um, more broadly and perhaps in a less exaggerated sense by assuming a uh, more realistic low but positive correlation between our two risk assets. So let's say our first asset has an expected return of 10%, a standard deviation of 15%. Our second asset has an expected return of 15%, standard deviation of 20%. And again, they are weakly, positively correlated with each other. Now we can take our optimal calculus-derived rule and see that the weight on the first asset is therefore going to be the standard deviation of the second asset minus, sorry, the variance of the second asset minus the product of the standard deviations of the two times the correlation between the two over the variance of the first plus the variance of the second minus two times the product of their standard deviations times the correlation again. And if we calculate out this expression, we're going to get a weight of 0.67 on the first asset, and therefore 1 minus that, 0.32 on the second. Now, given these weights, we can actually then figure out what the expected return and risk on the portfolio of these two assets with these particular portfolio weights would be, right? We remember our formula for the expected return on the portfolio, which is just weight of the first asset times expected return on the first, plus weight on the second times expected return on the second. And indeed, if we plug in our new, newly derived weights and given expected returns, we see that the expected return on the portfolio is 11.31%. What about the variance? Well, here again, the variance of the portfolio with two risky assets formula uh, comes to our aid. We plug in our weights, our uh, standard deviations, and our covariance. And we see that, sorry, our correlation, I should say. And we see that our portfolio variance is going to be 13.08%. So, and remember, this is the minimum variance portfolio we're solving for. So, the lowest variance we can obtain is 13.08% with these two assets, um, which, if you will notice, is actually lower than the uh, standard deviation. Sorry, the standard deviation we can obtain is 13.08. That's lower than the standard deviation of either of these assets. So, even though they are positively correlated, we can still create a benefit from diversification uh, by actually getting a standard deviation that is lower than either one in separate, but at the cost of having a lower expected return than either one of them as well. Now, how would we do if the correlation were actually negative? Well, all we need to do is just plug in the new updated correlation, let's say negative 0 0.30, into our uh, minimum variance portfolio weight formula. We can, and I encourage you to do this on your end, actually plug it in and check that the numbers actually do come out. So we're going to have a different weight on asset 1, different weight on asset 2, and therefore the expected portfolio return is going to be 11.57, not too different from what we had before, because remember the returns on the individual assets haven't changed. All that's changed is the correlation between them and consequently the weight we assign to both of them. And the weights didn't drift a whole lot either. Well, what about the variance? Well again we plug in all of the givens into our uh, portfolio uh, variance formula we can take the square root of the variance to get the standard deviation, and we see that that's only 10.09%. In other words, a substantial reduction in standard deviation, um, again, entirely due to the fact that we now have a negative correlation between our two risk assets.
So to summarize, if two assets are positively correlated, we can still see a risk reduction, but not a great one. But if we compare that to a case where they are negatively correlated, we can actually see not much of a change in the portfolio returns, but a substantial risk reduction. And we can sort of extrapolate from this pattern that the lower the correlation would fall, uh, the greater benefit we would realize in terms of diversification, um, the lower our minimum variance portfolio standard deviation could actually go. And of course, if the correlation between the two assets were a negative one, uh, then the standard deviation of the minimum variance portfolio would be zero. How can we see this? Well, let's actually plug that into the formula. Remember, we actually showed what the minimum variance portfolio weight would have to be if the assets were negatively correlated, but we could recover this by, again, taking a derivative of our uh, portfolio variance formula with respect to weights and then just plugging in negative one for the correlation. We see that the weight on the first asset would be 0.57, therefore the weight on the second asset would be 0.429. The expected return on the portfolio would be about 12.4%, and the standard deviation, well, that would be zero. Now, what would happen if we picked some other weight? Well, we know what our returns would be in the portfolio as a function of any arbitrary weight. It would be the expected return on the first asset, which is 10%, times the weight we assign to it, plus 1 minus whatever we assign, times the expected return on the second asset. And if we collect terms in W, we can actually express this as just 15 minus 5W. So for each additional unit of weight that we assign to asset number one, we're essentially giving up 5% of return, uh, just because you get 5% more with, with asset two. Now what about the variance of the portfolio? Well, we'll again take our variance formula, just plug our weights in, collect terms, and then simplify, and we will actually see that then we get this quadratic expression uh, where the variance of the portfolio is going to be based on the weight to the first asset squared minus a linear term in the weight on the first asset plus a baseline of 400. So now that we actually have a function for both the mean and the variance of a portfolio for any arbitrary weight uh, to the first asset, and therefore, of course, the consequent weight to the second asset. Let's actually look at what the possible combinations might be. We can essentially say that if we have the weight on the first asset of zero, in other words, we're fully invested in asset two, then we just get the risk of asset two and the expected return of asset two. If we increase our allocation to asset one, now we're somewhere in the middle, our risk goes down a bit because remember these assets are uh, weakly correlated. And our expected return comes down as well because remember asset one has a lower expected return than two. And at some point, we can get all the way down to our minimum variance portfolio that we derived initially. This is assuming that correlation of 0.2. And then we can even go higher in our allocation to asset one and all the way to 1.0, in which case we get both the risk and return characteristics of asset one. So this sort of sweeps out a frontier of possibilities, uh, a minimum variance frontier. Now this was um, a very important concept in portfolio theory. Essentially, it says, here's the best you can do. You can reduce your variance, or well, really, no matter what you pick, no matter what weight you pick, here are the different options you could get in terms of portfolio standard deviation and portfolio returns, including minimum variance, 
And if we plot this graphically, we can actually see that we have some sort of parabola shape as we get either all the way down to asset 2 or to asset 1, um, or I suppose maybe another in reverse order asset 1 and asset 2 and asset 1. Um, our return is actually uh, not necessarily as good, at least when taken against our portfolio standard deviation, and then when we're out somewhere in the middle between these two, uh, then we actually get a beneficial trade-off. And then we get that global minimum variance portfolio. This is as far as we can push down on the uh, portfolio risk axis. This would be that 13% standard deviation beyond which we can't really go any lower. So this is the minimum variance frontier just again sort of re reflecting all of the possible combinations of portfolio uh, risk and return. There are also options available on the interior, but we really only would care about uh, probably the stuff on the edge of it, on the frontier, simply because that's where the most attractive risk and return combinations lie. So. How does the minimum variance frontier look like for some special cases? Well, let's say if the correlation between two assets is 1, well then there's no diversification benefit, then the frontier is just a straight line, right? Essentially it would look like this. The more you allocate to the higher risk asset, the more your uh, both return and risk increase, and this increase is linear because there is no diversification. Now, what if the correlation were instead zero? Well, then we would get this sort of bow shape where actually there is a diversification benefit. We can actually reduce our portfolio uh, variance. We can have some sort of minimum variance portfolio uh, that has a substantially lower variance than either asset 1 or asset 2, and we can have some maybe attractive combinations of risk and return on the upper side of this frontier, since these would be for any particular level of risk, the highest possible expected return you could get. And finally, if the correlation were perfectly inverse, perfectly negative, uh, we would, of course, get a really exaggerated minimum variance portfolio that takes us all the way down to zero. Because remember, we showed that we could actually produce a minimum variance portfolio with no standard deviation uh, by taking two assets that are perfectly negatively correlated. So that means that we touch the vertical axis somewhere along here. And that means that we have uh, this really bowed out shape uh, with a correlation of negative. So what is the minimum variance frontier? Uh, we can think of it in, in two ways. First of all, it tells us the minimum amount of risk you must take if you want a certain level of return, or alternatively, the maximum return you could get for a certain level of risk. In other words, remember, there's a bunch of stuff on the interior set of possibilities uh, of these portfolios, but that stuff wouldn't be as attractive because for any certain level of risk, you can always just go up to the edge of the frontier and get a bit more expected return. Or if you have a lower level of expected return in mind, you can just go down to the edge of the frontier and get a certain uh, lower level of risk. So it's important to remember that this minimum variance portfolio is not actually uh, the optimal risky portfolio. It just minimizes the uh, amount of risk you take. The optimal portfolio would be the one that maximizes your reward to risk ratio. Remember, that's the sharp ratio, the one that gives you the most positive slope of the capital allocation line. 
But one thing that we can learn from this minimum variance frontier is just that some portfolios are going to be dominant relative to others. In other words, if you are a risk-averse investor and you are, for example, considering portfolio A versus B, you would obviously choose portfolio A, right? Because both of them have the same risk on the horizontal axis, but portfolio A has a much higher return on the vertical axis. And indeed, we can make the same argument for any portfolio on the frontier above the minimum variance portfolio. That one's going to dominate any portfolio on the lower side of the frontier, below the minimum variance portfolio. So we can think about mean variance dominance essentially as saying that if the expected return on one asset is higher than that on another, while their standard deviations are the same, then portfolio A or asset A will be mean variance dominant to asset B. We can characterize this graphically by saying that literally any point on the frontier above minimum variance portfolio is going to be what we call the efficient frontier. And any point on, uh, on the frontier below the minimum variance portfolio is going to be the inefficient frontier. The efficient frontier is the stuff that mean variance dominates its counterparts on the inefficient frontier. And of course, again, the lowest point, and this would be one that we would include on the efficient frontier because there's no point that mean variance dominates it, uh, would be the global minimum variance portfolio. And then, of course, we can again consider some individual securities within the frontier, uh, but those would be also mean variance dominated by the frontier because if we consider, for example, this security, well, for its level of risk, wherever it falls on the horizontal axis, we could actually do substantially better in terms of return by going up here to the frontier. Same for this asset, we could go up here for this asset and for this asset. So really then what we've learned is we really want to make our investments somewhere along this, not a line, it's uh, more of a parabola, but somewhere along this curvilinear shape that sweeps out those possibilities that we uh, calculated for the expected returns and standard deviations of combinations of our risk assets. So because of that, we actually know that nobody's really going to want to be on the inefficient frontier, um, any point below the minimum variance portfolio, simply because they can actually do better uh, by going to its counterpart above the minimum variance portfolio. In other words, for the same level of risk, uh, just picking the one on the higher expected return side of the mean variance frontier. So anything below the minimum variance uh, portfolio is the inefficient frontier, and nobody really will invest there. And everything above it is the efficient frontier. That's sort of the investment opportunity set if all we have to go on is risky assets. And we can see, of course, how this would generalize to more than just two risky assets. 